Okay, let me start my program. Yeah. <clears throat> Disclaimer. Now, nothing in this seminar videos will be used. Okay. Um, you cannot, I mean, will, will be used as a reference in any court of law or any legal uh, proceedings. Okay. This IP talk is basically for general information purposes only. All right. And we reserve and we disclaim all responsibilities from anything therein. Okay. Now, for those of you, maybe um, you're not, maybe it's new to you, or maybe it's uh, first time, first time, you know, it's, a, it's your first time here. Um, you see, IP, intellectual property, in IP rights, we have many branches of IP rights. You have the patent law, you have the trademark law, industrial law, copyrights. For the past uh, IP talk, series one to series five, I've been emphasizing on uh, trademark laws, okay? I've been emphasizing on trademark laws. And tonight, I will actually um, look into very detail into, you know, we, I, I'll start looking into the patent law. All right. Uh, why? Okay. So tonight will be patent night. So basically, what's a patent? A patent is an exclusive right granted to an invention, which can be a product or process or both because it provides a new, way, a new way of doing something or offer a new technical solutions to a problem. It gives you an exclusive right and it can prevent others from, you know, uh, from using, from selling, importing, distributing your patent invent patented invention without your permissions. So here's the deal. Now, a lot of people came to see me and then they asked, hey, Lawrence, can you do a patent for me? Okay, can you help me do pattern something, something, something? So let me explain to you in very general terms, okay, the, the, the relationship between the state and the patentee. Now you are inventor, you are a patentee. You, by law, you are disclosing your invention to the government. The government can be any government, yeah, can be the, 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 the respective government, yeah, like Singapore, China, or whatever, okay? You disclose to the, in, in Malaysia, for example, you disclose to the Malaysian governments. And in, in return, if the governments, um, they have conducted their examinations, they have uh, satisfied that you satisfy all the laws of uh, patent, and they will grant you a monopoly of 20 years. And that is a deal. You have to disclose your inventions. Now, if you do not disclose your inventions, no way the government is going to give you the monopoly, okay? So the first questions that I need to, you need to ask yourself before you want to proceed further and uh, you know, uh, investing a lot of money, you know, um, uh, hiring people like us or filing, protecting your patents you know, and all this thing. You need to ask yourself, whether should I, this, should I patent, should I patent my inventions or not? Okay, because if you want to patent your inventions, then you need to disclose it and your patent will become a public document. So anyone can actually get access to your patent and read your patent, okay? How you make the thing, the design, etc. blah, 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 blah. You will write a big story on that. On the other hand, if you choose not to patent it, then you better keep it as a trade secret. You're not gonna tell your anybody, you know? Nobody should know how it works, okay? Nobody should know how you do it, but, I just want to warn you because in today's modern technology, you know, it's very highly technology world. Um, everything is possible. You may, you know, we can, we may um, do a reverse engineering. And once people discovered, you know, your way, your trade secret, and it's no longer a secret, and then you cannot claim anything on it. All right. So that's the, that's the whole thing. All right. To patent or not to patent. All right. Every inventor, every researcher, these are the questions. This is the first main questions that you need to decide. Okay. So on one hand, you become a public document, but you get a legal protections, you get a legal recognitions over your inventions. On the other hand, you know, you just have to keep it very secret, like the uh, secret recipe of the uh, Coca-Colas, you know, uh, no one know how to make Coca-Colas. Okay. So until today, so it's a well-kept secret. Now, presumably, presumably that uh, you, you, you want to, you know, you, you, you are interested to proceed with the uh, filing your patent. 
No, now I'm going to explain to you today, okay? In a very brief, straightforward, okay? No legal jargon, not too much uh, boring case law studies, all right? Uh, very straightforward um, uh, explanations on the patent system or patent law in Malaysia. Generally, the patents, your invention is protected by the Patent Act, okay? Now, I have a book of patent. I have this, it's Patent Act 1983, okay? So, patents, in order to get a patent, you need to fulfill, you need to so-called satisfy the following requirements, all right? First, it must, you must fulfill the definitions or it must be an, a real inventions and it must not fall under the non-patentable inventions. It must be novel. It must involve an inventive steps and susceptible to industry applications, okay? Now, all these requirements, uh, we are going to discuss one by one tonight, okay? One by one tonight, okay? Now, let's start with the first one, yeah? Invention. What do you mean by an invention? An invention, according to the section 12 of the Patent Act, it means an idea of an inventor which permits in practice the solution to a specific problem in the field of technology. So it can be a product or a process or both. So, so you see, if you read the, 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 I mean the Act, the section 12, very carefully, you will find that this, I highlighted these two words, solution to a specific problem in the field of technology. So we are talking about patenting a solutions, okay, to a technical problems. There must be a, solu a specific problems, all right? So regulation 13, uh, 13 uh, sub 5 patent act says that invention must be of technical character, all right? It cannot be anything else. It must be a technical collect character. It must relate to a technical field, a science field. It must either be a physics or chemistry or whatever, okay? You must have a technical features, okay? And uh, written in the claims, in the claims of the pattern. I'll explain what is that later. So you know that product and process can be patented if it's an, you know, if it's an invention itself, okay? Give it, let me give examples of a product or process patent. Example, the coffee machines, the uh, method of harvesting a coffee, a coffee harvester, and uh, you know you have uh, processing coffee processing machines and all these things. Even a uh, air air tight cap, okay, bottle cap. That is also a pattern, all right, a, a products. So now before we go into um, talking about novelty, you know, and all these thing, every researchers must understand that you know. Um, you know, I always uh, deal with, I always try to filter out. Well, the first thing I always do is I want to filter out whether is your so-called invention patentable in the first place. So there are a list of non-patentable inventions by law. Okay. Now, so what are the non-patentable inventions by law? Under section 13 of the Patent Act, it actually excludes the following. Uh, subjects from being patentable. Number one, and we will we sh we will we will go into it one by one. Don't worry. All right. Don't worry. We have the whole night. Um, for those of you, if you think that uh, it's a bit boring, please go and make yourself a coffee. All right. You are staying at home. Uh, we cannot go anywhere. Right. Okay. Jangan pergi sana pergi sini. So make yourself a coffee, and then just listen and come with me very carefully. Yeah. The first one is the discovery, scientific theory and math mathematics problem, uh, methods, sorry. Um, that one cannot be patented, okay? So some professors came, some, uh, some economics, uh, you know, they came to me and say, I want to patent my, 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 my seminar notes or my, you know, my books on mathematics, on scientific theories, no, sorry, okay? Plant varieties or any essential biological process cannot be patented, all right? I'll explain that later. Scheme, rules, business, doing method of doing business cannot, all right? I found a way to calculate how to, when it will be the next financial crisis, no, okay? Method of treatments, humans, animal body, surgical, okay, diagnosis method, no. So all these summaries, all these list of summaries are non-patentable inventions, okay? Now don't try to be smart and file a patent for it, you will get rejected. 
Let me start with the first one, yeah, okay? Discoveries, scientific theories, and mathematics uh, methods. Now, if a person finds a new property to a known materials or article, that is merely discovery. If you discovered there's a virus called COVID-19, okay, virus, that is basically discovery, all right? That is unpatentable. How, uh, but if you can, you know, make the use of the discovery, turn it into a particular article or in a particular process, then it, can, it is patentable. Okay, then it's patentable. I'll explain to you later. For example, okay, now if you find a substance or microbes for, from the nature cause, then it is unpatentable. Okay, but if you develop a process for this purpose, uh, whether it's for the product or the process, these two, either one or both can be patented. One of the um, very good example will be the penicillin, okay, your antibiotics, because uh, it derived from the microbes, okay, from the uh, mi microorganisms, all right, from microorganisms, you turn it into uh, medicines, you know, for purpose, medicine purpose, medical purpose, then it can be patented, all right. So the microbe itself cannot be patented. Now, plant animal varieties, man made other than man made living microorganism and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I highlighted this word essentially biological. Now, I want you to understand, okay, for uh, if you are involving in the um, um, biological side of the research, I did something very interesting for you. Now, to determine what is essentially biological, it depends on the extent and technical intervention by man in the process, okay? If such in intervention is significant to get obtained result, then it is not essential, essentially biological and it is patentable. Let me give you an example. Crossbreeding, interbreeding methods, okay, of animal plants are essentially biological and not patentable. So if you tell me like, uh, Lawrence, I, I, I found a way to, uh, grow Busan King, you know, durian so that it will, you know, have, it will crossbreed into a very specific, a special kind of uh, fruits. All right. Sorry, that is a uh, crossbreeding, non patentable Okay. Essentially biological. All right. So essentially biological. However, if you come to me and say that, hey, I found a process of uh, treating a plant or animal to improve its property or the use to promote growth or suppress growth. And it's not just essentially biological and that will be patentable, okay? Some people actually ask me, hey, I found a method to actually um, uh, grow, grow durian, let's say example, durian king. Um, sorry, I mean Musang King Durian, okay? Musang King Durian. And um, uh, it involved many steps, you know, steps, many human interventions. And it's not just crossbreeding, it's involving so many, you know, because you have to look at the soil, you have to look at the chemistry, uh, the fertilizer, everything on the timing, blah, 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 this and that. Okay, is that patentable process? Yes, that's patentable process, okay? That is a patentable process. Now, treatment of soil, by technical means is also patentable, okay? Next, scheme, rules, method of doing business. Scientific theories are non-patentable. Mathematics methods are non-patentable, okay? Now you found a method, you found a way uh, to, to maybe to calculate, maybe you found a mathematic way to, you know, to count the probability of um, you know you getting a, a royal flush in the casino or a blackjack in the casino. Uh, sorry, that is uh, mathematics. <laughs> okay, that's a scheme. That's a rule or mental acts. We call it playing games. No, you found a chess game, a Monopoly or whatever. No, that is non patentable Okay. All right, and then um, method of treatment of human body. Okay. All right, so basically, surgery, surgicals are non patentable but it does not mean that the, the products, the apparatus, the equipment that you use are non patentable okay? We have uh, hundreds and thousands of uh, medical patents relating to 
medical devices, medical equipments and apparatus. All right. So it must be noted that this section 13.1D only excludes the treatment by surgery or therapy or diagnosis method only. All right. So, um, okay. Now, method of treatment. Wait, let me just put this down. Okay. Method of treatments of human and um, animal body by surgery or therapy, blah, 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 blah. Okay, let me give you a further example. Treatments of body tissues, the blood that you remove from the human or animal's body are not excluded from patentability as long as the tissues or fluids are not returned to the same body. You get me? Okay, now you get body tissues or blood from, removed from the human or, you know, you, you do it for cultivating or whatever you do, okay? As long as you don't put this tissue back to the same body, then that process can be patented. On the other hand, treatment of blood by dialysis, okay, with blood being returned to the same body would be excluded from patentability. Cosmetical, cosmetical surgery are excluded, okay? Um, for those audience, um, we, we don't have a Q&A session right now because let me finish off this slide first. Then we can make another time actually for the Q&A, okay? To be more specific, yeah? Into your person, into your uh, specific uh, matters. Can you hear me? Yeah? You can hear, okay, good. All right, application of substances for the body for purely cosmetical is which is not therapy, then you can be patented, all right? So always remember, yeah, okay? Therapies, no patent, okay? Mm. Computer programs, oh yes, wonderful. So many people ask me about this. Can I patent my computer programs? The answer is, if your computer programs claim itself on record on the computer, on the carrier, then it's not patentable, okay? But on the other hand, uh, if, a con if a program control machine for manufacturing or maybe for any other processors, then it can be patented, all right? It can be patented. So when I draft a computer claims uh, control apparatus, you must, include, you must include all the technical features of the invention, which are essential for the technical effect. It's not just the program itself. You must involve all the essential inputs and the outputs as well, okay? To make it a whole complete, whole complete uh, uh, pattern. Okay, so that's computer programs. That, that's the, you know, the non-patentable list. Now, let me go to, a, you know, something more details, okay? The, we are looking into the novelty and the inventiveness of, you know, uh, the requirements which are the, one, of the, one of the major, major, major requirements. And most of the time when we, um, you know, when lawyers, when they're cross fighting in the court, um, the other, of course the plaintiff will sue the defendant for infringement of patents. And then the defendant usually will counterclaim and say that your patent should be struck off, should be invalidated because uh, of a lack of uh, novelty and lack of uh, inventiveness. So these are the two very common grounds for every patent litigation in the world, okay? To, you know, as an excuse, as a ground to actually invalidate or struck off your patents. Always remember, okay, your patent can be struck off uh, if it's failed to satisfy uh, these major, these, these two major requirements, okay? And when you submit your patent for what they call it for examinations, but examiners will actually look into the novelty part and also the inventiveness part of your patents, all right? Besides that, of course, uh, let's assume that your patent is an invention which, is, which are patentable subject. Okay, let's come to the first one. So what's your, what do you mean by novelty, yeah? Okay, an invention is new if it's not anticipated by the prior art. Section 14, this is what they say. No, okay, you note the word prior art. So what's the prior art? Basically the prior art is everything disclosed to the public 
anywhere in the world by written publication, by oral, by use, or by any other way prior to the prior date of the patent application claiming the inventions. Okay? And um, all the content of a domestic patent having an earlier priority date. When, when I talk about the priority date, uh, it actually means that the date of the application itself. Okay, the date of the application itself. Okay, and um, if you read the if you read my first sentence very carefully, an invention is new if it's not anticipated by the prior art, meaning to say that your invention, okay, is novel if it's not found in any of the prior art. Okay, that's as simple as that. Okay, so that's why it's always. I always tell people, please do not disclose your inventions to the world. Please do not disclose. Uh, please do not disclose it before you file your patent for it. Okay, why? Because if you disclose it, it will become a prior art, and you will lose the novelty. Okay, you will you are not entitled to apply for this patent anymore. Even though you get a patent registration, it can be struck off. It can be invalidated due to the lack of novelty. So please, again, my dear uh, you know, participants, audiences, please do not file, but, uh, please do not disclose it before you file it. That includes publication at any international or domestic journals, okay? by any written publication or by use. Use can be a demo, okay? Some people are very excited. They want to demonstrate to the world that, you know, what he or she has been invented. So, you know, they usually took it to the trade fairs and demo it. So you are actually disclosing your inventions and indirectly it will actually struck off your novelty, okay? Your patent can be invalidated at, at the end of the day due to the lack of novelty. Now, what happens if your partners or anything, you know, or any abuse of rights happen during this time? Okay, someone, maybe your counterparts took your inventions and then they disclose it. And they, of course, there's a non-disclosure agreement uh, on it. So basically, if that is the case happen under section 14, subsection 3 of the Patent Act, you have basically one year period to file for your patent protection. Otherwise, gone case. Okay, so what are the tests for novelty? Eh? How do we assess novelty? Okay, actually novelty is quite straightforward, to be honest. So when you ask me to do a patent search, the most difficult part is not the novelty test, it's the inventiveness test, which I will, I will explain to you later. Okay, as a patent agent, we will devote most of our time. Actually, we are more concerned about the inventiveness of your invention rather than the novelty part. Because the novelty part, you know, it can be answered in these two very straightforward questions. Okay, now, first, has, you ask yourself this question, okay? Every time, when you want to do a self-check, okay? When you have invented something, you want to do a self-check, it's very simple. Ask yourself this question. Has a particular document or action has been disclosed in such a way that it make it part of the prior art? And are the details, the details. Now you might publish some of your uh, literature, you know, through any publication or journals or anything, but did you actually disclose the crux of it, the essential part of it, okay? Or you just simply just disclose it and just, um, you know, briefly disclose it. So we are talking about the details, all right? So are the details or the disclosure of the documents or actions such a way to destroy the novelty? So um, if you are forced to write an article, I mean, to publish a journals or publish anything, my opinion is that do not disclose the essential Point of point away, okay? You just how you do it, I don't know because you are the inventor, not me, okay? You just disclose it, okay? Just don't disclose the essential part of it, 
Take my word. Do not disclose the essential part of it. Okay, now we are looking at the effective date of disclosure. When we, as a lawyer, when we, you know, during the uh, pattern, uh, you know, invalidation proceedings, lawyers will normally disclose, will, will, will bring up evidence and proof to tell you that your invention has been disclosed. It's not new and it's part of the prior art because it has been disclosed even before your filing date, before your priority date. Okay, so this is, this is normally what they do, all right, to so-called invalidate your patents due to lack of novelty. All right, so what is novelty? How do we consider novelty? Let me give an example, yeah, okay. We have document X, we have document Y, and I am such a smart inventor, a researcher. I read document X and I read document Y, Document X comprising of component A, co document Y com comprising of component B. And I mix it together. A, B. I found a way to actually incorporate the A and the B components together in a new invention. Hey, is this something novel? Is it something new? Yes, by law, it's new because no one has used it before. And can the examiner use uh, this X and Y together to attack my novelty? The answer is no. For novelty comparison, you have to do it one by one document. You see, document X might consist of document uh, component A, but it doesn't tell you how to incorporate component B and vice versa with document Y. So I found a way to put these two jugs together. Okay, fantastic, right? So can I actually patent, I can, can I consider my invention new? The answer is yes. But is that the end of the story? The answer is no, because you still have to, you know, the subsequent inventiveness test will come in and will struck you off, perhaps. So, but for novelty purpose, the answer is yes, you are novel. Your invention is novel. So when you, when you, want me, when you ask me to do a search report for you for novelty, I can easily do it because as long as there's no single document uh, to compare, to compete you know, against my, my invention, okay, then I am considered novel. Okay? So again, let's come back to these four points. Yeah? Remember, yeah? okay? the first one is when you consider uh, novelty, it is not permissible to combine separate items of the prior art together. Okay? You have to do it separately one by one. Your, some of your components, some of your claims, some of the essential claims might found in several documents, A, B, C, D. But am I still considered novel? The answer is yes. If you found a way to incorporate A, B, C, D together into one, yes, you are still novel. But is it inventive? I don't know. We'll discuss that later. So, Number two, okay, this means that uh, even with a very minor variant, a minor feature found, not found in the prior art, you still can claim novelty on that, you know, okay? Technically, you can claim novelty on that, but are you going through the obviousness test? We don't know, okay? So, and number three, yeah, a document can destroy the novelty of invention either by expressly or impliedly. So you are so clever to show people, you try to show off, then that's it, okay? End of story. Or you try to tell the whole world that, you know, you have invented a formula, you show the formula out to the whole world, and I wish you good luck, okay? Now, a prior document should be read as it would have been read by a person having ordinary skill in the, on the, in the art on the effective date of the documents, okay? The effective date will be the, 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 the document itself. We're looking at the documents, okay? We're comparing one by one. Okay, um, next. Now, this will be the hardest part. Uh, the following will be the quite difficult part for, for you guys to understand. But it is also a, the, the most difficult question for every pattern you know, agents or attorneys uh, like us to, you know, to, to answer, especially against when with the uh, pattern officers or the pattern examiners, okay? So what... So the second requirement here, it will be like uh, your invention must involve inventive steps, 
must involving an inventive steps. Okay, step or steps, I don't know, but it's an A means at least one. Okay, you must have inventive steps. So an invention shall be considered as involving inventive steps if having regard to any matters which form part of the prior arts, such inventive steps would not have been obvious. Now, I want you to take this note, uh, obvious to a person having ordinary skill in the art. This posita, P-H-O-S-I-T-A, is the short form of person having ordinary skill in the art. Okay. Now, when we determine whether your inventions, uh, sorry, your patent, I mean, your inventions are uh, involving inventive steps, we always have to deal with these two questions here. Number one will be the obviousness test. Number two will be who is the person, who is the posita, who is the posita, okay? What, you, who is the posita? When I say who, it means, you know, what kind of level of uh, education and the general knowledge? Of course, I, I will explain that later, yeah? Okay, so you need to deal with these two main questions. Huh? Is it obvious? And who is the posita? Okay. Now, question of inventiveness only arises if there's novelty. Okay, for university, yeah, for especially university, when you assess your uh, researchers' uh, inventions, okay, the first thing you need to do, if, of course, is make sure that the invention does not fall into the non patentable list, as I said earlier. Second, um, please only, um, you have to look into the novelty part first. All right, always look at the novelty part first, as I ex explained earlier. Because if there's no novelty, then you can totally forget about this inventive steps requirement. Because if you cannot pass the first test, if you cannot pass SPM, you don't expect to, you know, to, 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 to enroll in uh, university, university, university in uh, Malaysia, okay? Understand? That's the, you know, that's the, uh, that's the prerequisite requirements, I would say. Okay, so the question of inventiveness only arises if there is a novelty. Okay, if there is novelty in your inventions. Now, the consideration of inventiveness is usually based on disclosure of two or more documents. Now, this time is terrible, it's tough. Okay, because when they assess your inventiveness, they will look at two or more documents. They will read the documents uh, across and then they will, of course, they will based on the uh, so-called uh, posita, the person having ordinary skill in the art, to assess whether, you know, is this obvious? Is your invention obvious? Okay? And, of course, if you think that, now, a lot of people ask me this question, yeah? Um, it seems like I have the novelty, but I don't think I can pass this second requirement test, which involves inventiveness, inventive steps. So, what should I do? My opinion, my suggestions to you is that you may consider filing and utility innovations. Uh, UI is also as good as a patent, but I don't know why uh, some, you know, some organizations, I not to mention who, um, they try to, you know, uh, downgrade the UI as a sub patent, but legally speaking, it's as good as a patent, okay? Because UI basically do not require the examination of the inventive steps. So you can save a big, big hassle out of it, okay? So if your invention is not that great, okay, it's okay. Try UI, no problem, all right? You still get a UI registration at the end of the day and you still can maybe commercial it successfully. Okay, um, let's... I will I want to give you an example here. Let's say if we have document X and document Y again. All right. Document X and document Y are both prior arts documents. Okay. And then uh, document X consists of component A and document Y consists of component B. And then your invention, you cleverly incorporate A and B into one. So is it obvious for a per for a skilled person? Well, the answer can be yes, the answer can be no. Why yes? Because if the skilled person, after reading these two documents, you know, A, X and Y, 
they, they know about the, the, the existence of the uh, component A and B, and he or she could have uh, know how to incorporate, how to mix this thing together. So that is obvious, okay? Now, I, I'm sure everyone also know how to mix coffee, kopi o with te susu, and you become what? The Chinese say cham, is it cham? Cham, oh, cham. So that's obvious. Everyone also know how to do it. Then that's obvious, okay? That's the definition of uh, obvious, all right? Okay. Um, oh yeah. Now, the invention can be non-obvious. Why? Because the, it, the process of mixing or incorporating A and B might create something very, very um, inventive, must be inventive. So then that will be obvious, okay? Now, let's look at the obviousness test again. Uh. Well, in the US, they call it obvious. They call it obvious, okay? <laughs> they use the term obvious. Uh, Malaysia, we use the term also obvious, but we also based on the posita, person having ordinary skill in the art would have. Okay, so the test will be whether, okay, ask yourself this question, yeah? Ask yourself these questions. Now, inventors, if you think, if you're not, before you come to see people like us, okay, pattern agents or whatever, you can actually do a self-test, okay? Now, take out the whole list, the checklist. So I pass the novelty test. Now I want to pass the inventive step test, requirement test. So how should I do it? Very simple, okay? You can actually um, get your colleagues. The best is your, always your colleague who has no knowledge, no knowledge about your invention. You may sign an NDA with him or her, you know, uh, please do not disclose it. I just ask you for free consultations. I'm not gonna pay you, but you know, you, you are obliged to answer my, my, uh, my questions, okay? So it's fair, all right. So let me ask you a question. Would you be obvious, okay, uh, whether at the prior, ask this question, whether at the priority date of the claim, having regard to the art known at that time, during this time, okay, it would have been obvious, would it have been obvious to any, to the person, to the person having the ordinary art in the skill, which is your colleague perhaps, okay? Maybe your friends or your colleagues, the person in the same industry, same knowledge, okay? To arrive at something falling within the terms of the claim. If your friend can actually, or your colleagues or, or someone like, you know, having the same, same skill in the art like yours, or I mean, even not you know, like you, okay? Of course you are much cleverer because you are inventor. Um, having the same standard of skill could have arrived to something like that, then the claim is bad for inventive steps. Okay? Now, I want you to understand the word terms obvious. Uh. Obvious does not require you to go beyond the normal progress of the technology, but just merely plainly follow logically from the prior arts. Okay? So you do need to find someone like so super, you know, so super clever than you to figure out what are you doing, okay? You can ask anyone having ordinary skill, maybe your students, I would say, okay? Okay, let me give you some example, some more example of the um, lack of inventive steps. Now, mere workshops, okay? Superficial ch changes or commonplace design features made to the prior arts. You took the prior art, you make some meal, some, some workshop changes, some, some, some minor changes, that is obvious. Mere repositioning of the components. You change the screwdriver with a nail, that is still fastening means. That is, or maybe you reposition it from the top, you put it at the bottom, the bottom you put it at the top, that is obvious, okay? All right. Mere combination of known devices, processes functioning in their normal way and not producing any uh, obvious uh, working interrelationship. Okay, that's obvious. Okay. Can you still hear me? Can I? Can I? Okay. I'm just afraid of the sound test. I, I must make sure that everyone can listen to me quite clearly. Yeah. If you have, if you cannot um, listen to me, please uh, raise up your hand. Huh? Okay. It's either your speaker got problem or my mic got problem or both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, obvious test. Uh, come on, you have to relax a bit. Okay, it's MCO, it's FMCO, all right? 
All right, everyone stay at home and listen and watch webinar I talks. Okay, IP talk six. The invention claim must be considered as a whole. Okay, it cannot it, it cannot be separately uh, judged a combination of claims are obvious. Then the okay, you see when we when we draft a claims for you know for inventors, it's very important that um, uh, you know uh, we have to actually draft. We, 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 have, we normally draft a very good independent claims, of course, and followed by the dependent claims. Now, although some of the elements or features in the independent claims or the dependent claims, uh, you know, are common, you know, common features or maybe um, obvious features, but it does not jeopardize the whole claims, all right? So, and under Regulation 19.3 of the Patent Act, uh, your independent claim, you see the first thing when you do, uh, my, my fellow friends here, okay? Um, I'm sure you have your own patent attorneys, okay? If you, if you don't have, maybe you can maybe consider using trademark to you. But you see, the first thing that you do is to look at the claims, particularly the independent claims, okay, of your patents, okay? That's most important. Because during any patent litigations, uh, okay, your defendants will always try to invalidate your patent claims. Always try to invalidate. Uh, this is not, not novel, not inventive, blah, 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 and all this thing. Okay? Now, in, for obviousness tests, if your independent claim is new and non-obvious, and there won't be any need to investigate the presence and absence of inventive steps over the dependent claims. So you see we have a both both stages, the independent claims and the dependent claims. So if the independent claim is, is non-obvious and is new, then okay, end of story. Examiners, the court will not look into the dependent claims anymore because the independent claim is sufficient to stand alone, okay? So that is under regulation 19.3 of the Patent Act. Okay, how do we lawyers uh, actually um, or patent agents, uh, how do we actually uh, uh, judge? Uh, how do we actually look at inventive steps uh, to determine whether of uh, how, I mean, uh, what are the inventive steps? Whether you, whether your invention your, your your invention involving any inventive steps, we always refer back to a very landmark UK Court of Appeal case, which is the Windsurfing International. Okay, this Windsurfing versus uh, Table Marines. UK, all okay? right. This is a very landmark case for uh, patent, especially when we uh, for patents, okay, for 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 determining this uh, what they call it inventive steps. Okay. Now the Court of Appeal in UK um, says that to answer the question of whether the alleged invention was obvious, whether your invention was obvious. You have to answer objectively, you have to look at it objectively by referring to whether at the material time, okay, at that material time, uh, the alleged inventive step or concept could have been obvious to a skilled addressee. Okay, uh, this is in summary. This is what the court say, la, okay. Of course, the court say a lot of things, okay, but I'm not going to explain, I'm not going to go into details today for the what happened during the case. Because if I do so, I think I would end my, uh, my, my webinar perhaps at 11 or 12. Okay. Um, so the court says that, okay, to answer the question of obviousness, you cannot just look at the high side at what is known now, okay? you have to bring yourself back to the priority date, to that time. If your patent was filed 15 years ago, you have to bring yourself back to 15 years ago, okay, at the priority date and asking whether the former flow naturally or obvious from the later. Um, but by, so this is the word they use. Who is the, as I said, who is the posita? Okay, who is the posita? is a hypothetical person. It's not a real person, actually. Okay? What they meant there is actually a hypothetical person. Hypothetical what would have been obvious 
add the priority date to a person's skill in the art to which the pattern in suit relates. Okay, now this is the term. You look at the, you know, if you couldn't understand much clearly, perhaps in your free time, rewind back this video and then um, read again, you know, read, repeat this sentence a few times, then you will get my, what, what, the, what the court trying to say. Anyway, the court actually set up the four-step approach. This is a, one of the landmark case and they set up a four-step approach to assess whether your inventions um, is involving any inventive steps. Now, I think maybe your organizations, universities, research management could adopt this you know, concept, these four steps to assess whether your invention is obvious, okay? It's non obvious or obvious, okay? Now, first, you need to identify the inventive concept of the inventions. You need to know what are the inventive concepts we are talking about here. Now, second, you need to assume that a normally skilled but unimaginative addressee in the art at that priority date, at the priority date means at the time when you file for the patent, and to impute to him what was at the time common general knowledge of the art in the questions, okay? So you have to find out what are the common general knowledge, you know, during that time or now, if you want to talk about now, that means now, okay? Third step, identify what, if any, differences between the matters cited, known or used and the alleged invention, okay? Now you have to compare what are the difference, Techn technical difference, huh? technically def differences or technical feature differences between the cited um, by then and your, of course, your inventions. And decide without any knowledge of the alleged invention, whether these differences constitute steps which would have been obvious to a skilled man. Okay, is your inventions obvious to a skilled man? I mean, a posita, we call it. Okay, or whether they required, whether it required any degree of innovations. So if it's required any degree of innovations, then of course this is not obvious. If it's something like very obvious, very common to a skilled person in this industry, of course then it will be obvious and it wouldn't, it is not lack of, it will therefore lack of inventive steps. Okay, I hope you get me, right? okay. It's a bit complicated here. Now, of course, as, as uh, they go, uh, that one was, you, you see, uh, windsurfing case was in the 1985. And we have another latest uh, UK landmark cases in 2007. It's called Pozzoli. Pozzoli, okay? The case of Pozzoli. The case of Pozzoli actually reformulated the windsurfing approach, but they changed the, a, a bit terms, uh, you know, they changed it to, they use the word state of art. Oh, technology. Take state of arts. So, I mean, you can follow these four steps. Okay. First, identify the notional person's skill in the art. Identify the relevant common general knowledge of that person. Um, I just want you to know uh, that actually in every uh, patent litigation, uh, these are the toughest questions that we need to answer, you know, especially in court uh, where two lawyers are fighting. The defendant lawyer will try to invalidate your patents and then of course they will try to first they have to bring out so many experts uh, to, uh, to put in their testimonies and all these experts they will ask them the very simple questions what would be the common general knowledge at the time okay all these things you know and let and, and then of course the court will you know will determine the level and uh, what, are, what are the common general knowledge and the notional of a person's skill in the art. So what, what is the notional person's skill in the art I want to use? And then what are the common general knowledge on the other hand? Step two, identifying the inventive concept of the claim in questions. And if it cannot be done, construe it. So the court actually can actually construe the inventive concept of your inventions. They, have, they can actually make, make it up and they can actually construct it. Okay, third step, 
identify what, if any, differences between exist between the matter cited as forming part of the state of art and inventive step claim as. Okay, so they'll compare the state of art during the time and your claims. Okay, now view without any knowledge and blah blah blah. Do these differences constitute steps which have been obvious to the person skilled in the art, or do they require any? You see, you come back to the same questions. Okay, the whole same question is that whether your differences in your whether the difference what are the differences uh, okay in your so called alleged invention compared to the uh, state of art at that time and then of course the court is trying to you know um, ascertain what are the common general knowledge at that material time and what are who are the notionless person skilled in the art so we have to determine this and then they have to compare what the notional people skilled in the art having the common general knowledge and would he be, would this would your invention be obvious to that notional person having ordinary skill in the art? Okay, so you see this is a very 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 compli compli complicated process. Okay, I hope you you don't fall asleep. Okay, and uh, if you finish one cup of coffee, please make another one. Okay, um, the last one I want to always emphasize will be the person having ordinary skill in the art. Okay. Now, I want to, I, I try my best to summarize in this, um, summarize for you. So when you determine inventive step requirement, examiner will normally take the person having ordinary skill in the art, posita, and assume to be a workman, a technician who is aware of any, everything in the prior art and who has the skill to make routine workshop, but do not exercise any inventive ingenuity, okay? So he's just a normal technical person. Okay, and when I say normal, it doesn't mean normal, uh, it's in, it means ordinary, uh, okay? The person's skill in the art is neither an inventor or a durer, but a competent worker. The hypothetical person possess general common knowledge relevant to the trade, but do not aware of any uh, scientific papers or particular patent specifications, okay? Um, such a person is capable of making routine workshop adjustment, but do not think laterally or that. Okay, now, you might not able to digest all this thing tonight. But what I suggest is that you may actually download my slides, okay? And watch my videos after this, and then uh, try to rethink again, okay? Those issues that I raised up, uh, especially when, you, when we deal with the inventive steps, okay? Now, of course, uh, the level, the subject matters of the pattern, uh, you see, uh, the posita, the person having ordinary skill in the art, it depends, you know, it depends on the, in, the inventions, your, your inventions, okay? That's why I say it depends on the level of knowledge um, required, who is the ordinary skill in the art. So if you are talking about chemistry, then the ordinary skill in the art must be someone who has sufficient jet common general knowledge in the art of chemistry, okay? Of course, you cannot find, you don't find a lawyer to be someone, an ordinary person, the person having ordinary skill in the chemistry because, I cannot do chemistry, okay? I fail my chemistry, okay? So um, um, that, that, that's it, understand? So it depends on the level, okay? That's why when during the uh, court litigations, uh, we always call so-called expert la, weaknesses, la, expert weaknesses, la, testimony, la, okay? We try to, the whole objective is to uh, strike off the, you know, uh, invalidate your patent. Okay, there's so much for inventive step. Now the final one will be industry application. An invention shall be considered industry applicable if it can make and use in any kind of industry, okay? It must be useful, it must be utilized, okay? You, can, you don't actually patent something for decorations. UI, as I explain later, okay? Now this is a comparison between the UI and patents. Okay. So one thing I want to take note about UI is that uh, UI only allow one claim, whereas the patent, you can have multiple claims. You can have uh, 100 claims, it's okay. But UI only one claims allowed. So the purpose of UI is to protect um, uh, petty in innovation, I would say, petty innovations. In some country, they call it petty patents, okay? Or small patent or utility models, something like that, okay? Okay, let's come to the uh, patent procedures, okay? 
Let me tell you something. Uh, you need to apply to get a patent. It's not free for you. Okay. It doesn't come automatic. It doesn't come automatic like your, you know, like the subsidies given by the governments. All right. So you need to apply for it and you need to fight for it. All right. So when you apply for a patent application, you need a patent specification. A patent specification normally consists of abstract statement, uh, background, drawings, detail, description, claims, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, a patent specific specification is both a technical and as well as a legal document, okay? It's a public document. Always remember that, okay? Remember the first thing, the first, uh, the first what do you call it? The first thing I, I, I discussed about, okay, before I started this, to patent or not to patent, because the patent will become one day, will become a public document. So whatever innovation, whatever, you know, formula that you need to disclose, you need to disclose to the world, okay? Anyone can get a copy of it by paying some money. Okay, this will be the, some examples of a US patent, okay? You see, you have a background summary and all this thing, abstract, blah, blah, blah. So patent basically is a set of documents that is like a novel, uh, it's a well-written novel, it's a very technical written novel, explain like how, 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 I mean, you know, for a person having ordinary skill, after reading your patent, he or she would actually know how to, uh, you know, uh, execute or maybe so-called uh, create the inventions, okay? So this is a light electrical, electrical lamp, you know, Invented by who? Thomas Edison. All right. It's a very old patent in 1800s. Okay, 1880. So this one is very old patent. All right. So I just want to show it to you. Okay. So this is the claim. You see, this is the example of the patent claims. I claim as my invention an electric lamp. Blah 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 blah. Okay. This is where you, where your uh, patent agent will actually help you to, you know, draft the claims. So this is one of the examples of the uh, information that you can, uh, you can obtain from the MIPO from Malaysia Intellectual Property Office, okay, for patents. All right. <clears throat> okay. There are several types of patent applications. Number one, now we have the national patent application. So example, Malaysia, every country, they actually run their own national patent registry. In Malaysia, we have a MIPO. In uh, Japan, we have JPO. In China, we have CNIPA and all these things. Okay, every country they maintain their own patent registry, and unfortunately, we you need to get uh, granted of certificate from all these countries in order to protect your patent rights. Okay, in these countries, otherwise, um, the legal effects, the, the the legal system will not protect you there. Okay. Now we have a regional patent office, like example, the Europe patent office. And we have this WIPO administered um, PCT, Patent Corporation Treaty and the Paris Conventions. Now I'm gonna explain a few of it today. So, because some of it will be very useful, especially for those of you who intended to commercialize your patents, who in intended to export your products. So you need to listen to this very carefully, yeah? So this is national patent applications in Malaysia. It takes up to three to five years. I do not know how long it will take now uh, because of MCO and all this thing, but roughly it takes up to three to five years to complete the whole cycle, a typical normal cycle from patent applications right up to the grant of patents. Now, during the, um, the patent application, uh, we have two stages of examinations. The first stage will be the preliminary examination and followed by substantive uh, examinations. Preliminary examination will normally check on the formality uh, parts of your, you know, your, your documents and the substantive or modified examination will check on the content such as the novelty, the uh, inventiveness of your patents, all right? So once you pass all these uh, tests, then you get a grant of uh, so-called patent. So, how long do I get? 20 years and please renew it every year, yeah? Okay. So, and can I file a foreign patent directly without going through the Malaysian or local, uh, what do you call it, patent registry? The answer is no. Uh, you can do it and by right, by right, you must file in Malaysia first two months before you file overseas. Otherwise, you must obtain the registrar permissions under section 23A, okay? 
you must obtain the permissions from the registrar of patent to allow you to file overseas, um, you know, without going through the Malaysia local uh, application. <clears throat> All right, let me introduce to you. Okay, how are you going to file overseas? Huh? One of the method will be through a direct filing to the national office of the counterpart countries via we are Paris Conventions. Okay, so what is this Paris Convention Treaty? Yeah? So Paris Convention, let me explain. Uh, okay, was founded in, in 1883, yeah, in the year 1883 by 11 countries. Okay, they founded this so long ago, about maybe 100 over years ago. Okay, and then um, by these 11 countries. And until today, we have about 169 countries which are a bite or you know have signed a treaty with this uh, Paris under these Paris conventions okay basically under the Paris convention you are given up to 12 months okay to file your patents anywhere in these Paris convention countries and claim the earliest date of filing we know it we call it the uh, date of priority okay date of priority so listen carefully, yeah. You need you have only twelve months period to file overseas, okay? You want to file in U.S., China, Singapore, Thailand, twelve months period only, under Paris Conventions. What happened if it's over, over the twelve months period? So if it's over the twelve months period, you are not able to claim the priority date as per the Malaysian date of filing. Let me give you this example. Assume that. You file your patent in Malaysia on the 1st of February 2021. So basically, you have until 1st February 2022, okay, 2022, to file your patent anywhere in, in the 169 countries under the Paris Conventions. Say, for example, Indonesia, US, China, you have uh, only 12 months period to file that. If you oh, if uh, if you do not file within the 12 month periods then you are not able to claim the first date of filing as per the malaysian's uh, priority date which is on the 1st february 2021 and then what happened is that um, any disclosure will actually um, you know will actually render your patent application being struck off in the respective jurisdictions okay because you lost the protection of the priority date period already. Okay, can you file it? Yes, you can file it, but you're gonna waste your money because uh, they're gonna they might gonna object you due to lack of novelty and all this thing. All right. So some people will say, "Hey, twelve months is it too short? Because I if I want to file in ten countries, ten over countries, it will cost me a fortune, and um, you know I need more time." to actually, um, you know, uh, file to, to complete my foreign application, uh, patent applications. So because of that, a group of countries that actually they gathered in, uh, in the year 1970s, okay, in Washington, in US, and then they signed a treaty. They call it the Patent Corporation Treaty. And that was signed on the 19 June, uh, 1970s, okay? Now, even they signed the treaties, but the treaty only entered in force on the 24th of January, 1978. Okay, so about 40, 40, 40 over years ago, all right, 40 over years ago. So initially, we have only 18 contracting states. We only have 18 contracting states uh, during 1978. But now, until today, we have about, um, 152 contracting countries signing to these PCTs, uh, what they call it, the PCTs uh, treaties under the PCT treaties. Okay, so what is this patent cooperation treaty all about? You see, um, PCTs actually is. Let me just introduce. Okay, just a just a quick introductions. Now. PCT is use, widely used by actually patentee, especially when they want to file in several countries. And uh, PCT only applicable to those 150 over contracting states. 
and this is administered by the World Intellectual Property Organization, the WIPO. All right. Well, basically, it involves two steps here. The first step will be the international phase, then followed by the national phase. Okay, I will show it to you. Okay. Now, if you look at this chart here, the chart here, you observe that the deadline, the priority deadline actually extended from the initial 12 months period under the Paris Convention, they extended to up to 30 months. You see, 30 months for you to do the national phase filing, to complete the national phase filing. When I mentioned the national phase filing, it means that you will still have to file in many, 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 many individual countries, okay? But you are given a longer time period and you are able to claim the priority date as per the initial uh, home country, the first filing, okay, in the, your home country, okay? This is the, one of the good things, okay? It extends the durations of the priority, priority date period to up to 30 months so that you got ample of time to maybe you need some more, more money to go to do your filings, you know, all these things. Okay, then you can, you, can, uh, you can do it. And besides that, PCT, okay. Uh, PCT actually, they, you know, if, you, if I look at this on the 16 months, on the 16 months, uh, if you look at the chart, okay, on the 16 months, uh, they will conduct the international search. They will produce you as international search report. So what is the prior art search? So what is this prior art search for uh, all about? Okay, you see during the 16 month, the patent examiners, the PCT patent examiners will review, okay, they will review your patent applications, the PCT application in the same way that the normal patent office ex examine your patent application. So they will look into and will, they will conduct search, okay, to determine whether your patent is novel, inventive, and industry applicable. Okay, and they will give you a summary report. Okay, and the report is so called the ISR report. And with this report, the good thing is that, you know, you can actually later, when you do, you, you can actually know the state, I mean, at the first glimpse, how good is your patent, whether your patent satisfied the novelty, the inventiveness requirements you know, before you actually spend more money and then go into the national phase, all right? Because please, there's no refund if your pattern actually get re got rejected, you know, at the uh, national phase, okay? You're gonna spend a lot of money, but at the end of the day, you might not get your pattern granted. So before you do that, you go for PCT, all right? The PCT will do a international search and examination for you and it will enable you to actually consider carefully whether you want to actually extend it to a national phase. This is very important for every patentee, especially if you intend to commercialize your, your inventions and you want to file you know, in the foreign markets, example, like China or US or whatever, okay? So um, when you file for the PCT, of course you will choose your International Search Authority. In short, we call it ISA. And they will do the job for you. Okay? So they will conduct the search normally 16 months, which is good because it's even faster. And normally, uh, my client, I would advise them to file for PCT. And once they got the PCT results, I will bring back, I will file it back at the Malaysian's uh, patent office. I will tell them, look, I already got the PCT report. It's novel and it's inventive. So please grant me the patents as soon as possible. Okay. And usually, normally, they will do that. Okay. So you shorten the time of the examinations. Okay. Maybe. In some country, they are very quiet. Land, people say, okay, they don't follow. But uh, most, of, most country, they will follow the uh, merits reports. So you can take advantage of this PCT reports, okay? PCT search report, all right? So it gives you an earlier glimpse so that you can avoid any office actions, you can avoid any infringement, or you can try to amend your claim so that you can avoid all this office action at the later stage when you want to file for the national office. So this is like a, a early warning report for you, okay? So what's the PCT for? You can file in individual countries, many countries, opportunity to enter, blah, blah, blah. Okay, 
Come back to the last stage, yeah? Last stage. Don't worry. Stay, stay with me, please. Uh, maybe another 10 minutes. Then we can go for our lucky draw, yeah? Okay. Um, so, patenting your inventions. Um, what's, a, what's a good use of the pattern, to be honest? Okay. From campus to commercializations. Oh, that's very nice. Okay. So, actually, pattern is good. when you, it, it helps you to maybe perhaps create revenue through sales and licensing. You can attract funding for your, you know, for your inventions and you can actually have a collaboration uh, opportunities because people will not invest in your company if you do not have a patent, okay? I mean, if you don't have a, a patented technology, okay? You may, you, may, you may write a beautiful proposal uh, explaining how good is your, you know, in innovations, but at the end of the day, you know, um, people still want to look at the real things, okay? You have, you have a pattern and all this thing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, always remember, please sign a non-disclosure agreement with your counterpart, all right? Uh, whenever you want to disclose your invention prior to the patent application, okay? So can I start manufacturing or can I start doing anything, disclosing after, you know, I found my patent? The answer is yes, but uh, you have to uh, file the patent first before you disclose it, okay? All right, uh, please observe the deadline. Uh, I, I would suggest that if you intend to file a pattern today, you need to draw out a time frame for yourself, okay? Uh, before we go, before you met, you, you are meeting your pattern agents, uh, your attorneys, okay? I always coach people like this. I always tell them, look, uh, you, you do your own self-analysis first, many times before you come and you know, talk to us because uh, Pattern agent, we are not scientists, we are not researchers, okay? We only can derive the, the knowledge out of, from the, in the, the researchers, okay? From the researchers or inventors. So, um, so you need to provide us a lot of information. Do not hide anything, you know, from us, don't worry, okay? A lot of people, they, they say, hey, I, I don't want to show you this can. Uh, I think you, you should, uh, okay? So, um, thank you so much. and. Uh, and wait. Okay. Um, so everyone's still with me here. I still have 85 attendees in this web Zoom webinar. Are you okay? If you're okay, please raise up your hand. Um, oh yeah, thank you so much. Okay. I want to ask if I found a pattern file in US and I'm using it to pay royalties. It's, okay, I'm so sorry because I cannot, I do not have the enough sufficient time to answer all the you know, Q and A. Um, I appreciate, I would really appreciate that um, we can have another sessions or you can actually um, um, call us, call our office or maybe speak to one of our, our IP associates Okay, we may be able to help you. And uh, because everyone has their own very unique uh, questions and I cannot just answer it like that. It, it's not fair for those who are waiting for, to be, you know, for the lucky draw, yeah? Okay, okay, I, I will actually, okay, this is my office number. Okay, how do I get the slides, yeah? Okay. Um, yes, you will get the slides from this uh, link, uh, trademark to you.com slash IP talk slash 06 dot PDF. Am I right? Okay. Have you uploaded? Uploaded, yeah. Okay, you can get a copy of my slides from this uh, URL, yeah. I repeat, for those of you watching from Facebook, okay, or maybe some other media source, 